Thank you, gentlemen. All right. How's everybody doing? Fantastic. Everybody ready for the word tonight? So glad you were with us. We look forward to Wednesdays as much as we look forward to Sunday. Look forward to seeing you midweek and believe we have something that will encourage you. We want to pick up on a message that we've been on, on uh, being protected as selected and protected. You know, the Bible tells us all kinds of things about how we are His special choice, His special treasure, and and uh, because of that, you know, just, just like we've said a number of different ways, because uh, anytime you have something of value, you look out to protect it, to keep it. And, uh, and so we see throughout the Word, we'll not go into all that because we've, this is our fifth message, and so if you, if you have missed any of those, go online to the multiple areas you can go. It won't cost you anything. Catch up. It's all good. The Word is good. Amen. Amen. But then uh, what we did is we moved on, and we've been talking about the fact that the Bible says that, yes, you are selected. Yes, you are His special treasure. But what the Bible tells us is there's certain things that we see in the Word that tells us that we have to keep ourselves, right? Not only does He keep us, but it's important for us to keep ourselves. And so 1 John 5.18 says, He that is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Notice that. He that is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not touches him not. And so we looked at a number of different things. You know, the Bible talks about dwelling in the secret place of the Most High. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He talks about no harm shall come nigh you. Amen. So it's important to dwell in in his house. It's important to stay close. We said it that way. But then the Bible also said that it's important to fear God. We said that that it's important to not get into fear, and actually that's where we left off. Specifically, we were talking about not getting into fear when it comes to your children, when it comes to your family, about trusting God with your kids as they they grow up from from infants to to going to school and going to college and getting married. You know, you got to cast that care over on the Lord, right? And so we're going to pick up there. We're going to move on a little bit. But again, just to remind you, our key verse is 1 John 5.18. He that is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Notice, he keeps us, but we have a responsibility. We are part of the equation, right? Don't ever take God out of the equation, but you're actually part of that equation as well. And so uh, one of the other key scriptures, I just like verse 27, but Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place. You know, there's things in your life that you could do that actually open the door to the devil. That word place, is a, it's a geographical word, actually. The word place is talking about a geographical location. It's talking about a marked off location. You know, when my, when my grandkids were growing up, when, when Jeremiah was, when it was just Jeremiah, he would get in the car, and any time that he got in the car, he would al- always ask to go to Mimi's place, Mimi's house. And so one of the first things I remember Jeremiah saying was Mimi's house, Mimi's house, Mimi's house. He'd get in the car with me, and it would still be Mimi's house. It's like, hey, dude, I own this house too, you know. I have a place. And so, so place, neither give place. Place is a geographical location. It, in fact, talks about a, a set of boundaries. You know, if you're talking about a place, you're talking, talking about boundaries. You know, our church building has boundaries. It's marked by specific locations and points. And you don't go, you know, our place doesn't go outside the confines of those markers and limits. Well, why is all that important? Because the Bible says neither give place. Don't give him one square inch of anything that applies to your life. Because I guarantee you the devil is territorial and he wants access to it all. He wants access to your money, to your health, to your marriage, to your relationships, to your job, to your ministry if you're in ministry. He wants access to it all. And so you need to clearly define Why are we talking about this? You need to clearly define your boundaries. You need to put up a fence of sorts around your life so that you can put up a sign that says, no trespassing here. Come on now, and you've got to be bold about it too. Don't give him one square inch. Don't allow him access. You know, the key is if we can shut every door 
and close every window and seal every place in our lives through which the enemy would try to gain access, then we, in fact, can prevent him from getting into the middle of our affairs. I'll say that again. We can prevent him from getting in to the middle of our affairs. You know, we can think about all kinds of different things. I, I don't know if we talk to you guys about the skunks in our pool house or whatever, but, but I remember at the, the house we used to live in, uh, Dennis can relate to this, but, but bees and wasps, they, they'll find every little crack you can find. They'll, they'll get into every little crack. And, and we, had a, uh, we had a bee problem. We started noticing in our, in our uh, garage, you know, we, that house was a three-story house, had the basement and then two levels. Well, we started noticing uh, bees in the, in the garage. Well, so we started paying close attention. We started making sure that the garage doors were closed and we didn't leave them open and we still kept seeing bees. And we started noticing them dying. You know, they would be buzzing around, they started dying. We started noticing them multiplying. And it didn't make any sense. You know, why they would come in the garage, we were quick to shut the door and whatever. Well, as, as we started looking, we started paying attention that they were actually coming in under the front steps of the porch and they were getting in through a small crack, and that crack led to the garage. Well, as I started looking, they had built this hive uh, behind the insulation underneath the steps. And so there was only one way to get rid of it, and that was to pull the insulation out and gain access to the hive. And when we opened that up, you should have seen Matthew and I, I thought about it at the last minute, but when Matthew and I went and did this, you know, we, we're in the garage, we can't go through the steps, we have to go from the garage side to get these things out, and so, I mean, we were covered from head to toe in like ski mask and gloves and long sleeves, and I think this was summertime, and so, and then, and then we put duct tape around to make sure that nothing could get in through our sleeves, kind of building a bee suit, you know, and uh, I should have just gone and got your bee suit. And so uh, we were a sight, man. We were a sight. And so, so we started, started uh, figuring this thing out. And when you got in the, when you started walking down the steps of our basement to the, to, from, the, from the second level down to the basement, they were right there at the bottom. And so what we had to do was to pull that insulation back and expose the hive so that we could get rid of them. Now, Dennis, don't listen. You don't want to hear this. But we had a massacre. <laughs> I mean, we... We found some spray and we had a massacre, man. But I tell you what, it was hairy there for a minute. Because it's, because when we pulled that when we pulled that insulation back, they were not friendly. And so thank God we had all that stuff on there. <clears throat> but the gist of the story is, is we also not only did we get rid of them, but we had to close that space up. We had to make sure that we didn't allow them access back in. Well, there's things in our life, there's areas in our life that we deal with, and of course we've been talking about some of these things. We allow the enemy access, but once you kick him out, how many of you know you've got to make sure he don't come back? Because he's persistent. I said he's persistent. And so it's important for you to stay in the Word and make sure that you're practicing the Word to make sure that he doesn't get back in the middle of your affairs. Well, one of the next things we want to talk about is the Bible clearly defines for us, and of course we've been reading this scripture as our key scripture, but it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Well, when it talks about anger and wrath, what's it talking about? It's talking about your dealings with other people. Right? Are you listening to me? And so one way that we can keep the devil out of the middle of our affairs is to walk in love. Now this is a real popular subject whenever you're having trouble in it but I believe it's one of the most important. You know, we, we said from the beginning, this isn't a, an exhaustive list. This isn't in order by importance. This is just a list. But I firmly believe that you're going to see that this is one of the most important things that you can do in your life to make sure that you don't allow the, the enemy access to your life. One of the entry points that he uses is to gain access into our lives through relationships. Whether you're talking about unresolved issues carnal, ugly conflict. Anybody ever got into an ugly conflict with somebody? Come on now. Most conflict is ugly. Let me clue you in on that. Most conflict is ugly. 
but we're talking about, you know, whether it's with a loved one, whether it's with a coworker, a neighbor, a stranger. I think we can relate to that as much as anything because it's easy for you to get in conflict with a stranger, isn't it? It's easy for you to get mad with somebody that you don't know, you don't have a relationship with. But what about the loved ones? What about the ones that you do have a relationship with? See, we come across all kinds of people, you know, from all walks of life, right? You think about somebody like Will back here. He's, he works for the sheriff department. Man, he comes in contact with all kinds of people. But if you're not right with the Lord and you're not walking with the Lord, then let me tell you something, that's an easy place to allow your anger to get the best of you. So you've got to make sure you're doing what the Word says. You've got to make sure that you're walking in love. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, we're, we're going to see a number of different things. I, I think Rick Renner said it best. He said, if you intend to live a full life on this earth, part of the package includes living with people who are far from perfect, who do things that occasionally surprise you and disappoint you. See, it doesn't matter if it's the person you're waking up next to in the morning or the people you're working with at work or the people you're sitting right next to tonight. People are going to challenge you. People are going to do things that cause emotion to rise up within you. And what we're talking about is, is oftentimes people that are going to do things that are, they're, it's going to surprise you. We, we had a situation that we're dealing with in the school right now. And let me tell you something, that one of my first reactions was, I don't understand. You're talking about a situation that really, at, at the heart of the matter, it surprises you. People surprise you. I said, people surprise you. You know, you, you can go to a minister's conference. We just went to a minister's conference about a month ago. You can go to a minister's conference full of ministers, full of people that love the Lord, and you get them out there on that NASCAR racetrack. Buddy, let me tell you something. You see a side of them come out. I don't remember. It was 10 years ago or something. We, we typically end up over Pigeon Forge, Dollywood, just because it's centrally located. Our region is Kentucky and Tennessee, and so it just... They've got a lot of activities and a lot of big hotels that accommodate 100 people. And so, uh, so we took all these ministers over there to the NASCAR theme park. You know, they've got all the racetracks and things. We had two guys get kicked out of the park. Two ministers of the gospel. Two guys that preach on Wednesday and Sundays. If I said their name, you'd probably know who it was. Because they've been here. Got kicked out of the park. Because they got behind the wheel of that little cart and they lost their ever loving mind. <laughs> True story. Yeah. Man, people will surprise you, people will do things. But again, if you intend to live a full life here on the earth, in other words, when you get out of love, it costs you. When you get out of love, it in fact shortens your lifespan. You ever found yourself saying, I can't believe they would ever do that. Yeah, we've all said it. Maybe you've pointed to yourself and said, I can't believe you did that. Huh? But remember Ephesians 4, 26, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. You know what wrath is? Wrath is, is violent, extreme anger mingled with contempt, disgust, and hatred. It's, it's, it's anger on steroids. And so the Bible says, be angry and sin not. Why does it say that? Because you're going to get angry in this life. You're going to have challenging situations because you deal with people every day. But what's it saying? You're going to have those moments of anger, but stop it right there. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Make it right. Right? Make it right. Make sure that you're doing your part to make it right. I like in the Passion Translation, verse 26 says, don't let the passions of your emotion. See, that's, that's truly what we're talking about. Don't let the passion of your emotion lead you to sin. Don't let anger control you or be fuel for revenge, not even for a day. Not even for a day. Because that's what happens is it be, it, it, those passions of your emotions, uh, they are fuel for revenge. Contempt. We said anger mingled with contempt. Contempt is one of the strongest expressions that we find in our vocabulary of a mean opinion which the language affords. Don't ever get into contempt. 
Don't ever allow your anger to get to a point where it's wrathful and, and it's ugly. Look over at James chapter 1. And again, I think it's important to point out that you're, we, we all face those moments, those moments that challenge us. We all face those opportunities. James 1, 12 through 15 says, Blessed is the man that endures temptation. Well, that's what we're talking about. Everybody's tempted. Blessed is the man that endures temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted that God is tempting me. Doug, when Michelle challenges you, don't say God's tempting me. <laughs> for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts any man, but... Every man is tempted, now watch closely, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, or just simply another word for desires, and enticed, for when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin, now watch this, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. So these conflict points, these, these ugly carnal conflicts that we get into with each other, these conflict points become the entry point through which the devil tries to gain access. And again, he slips in through the cracks and gains access and builds an offense in our minds. And once he does, a great wall takes shape that eventually separates us from the people that we need and we love. That's why this is important, just that last statement alone, that eventually separates us from the people we need and we love. We need that neighbor. We, we need that coworker. We need that, that relative. We need them. The body of Christ needs them, whether they realize it or not. And what happens is a wall of offense is built, and, and we allow it to be built up, the very thing that separates us. You've got to be careful about these things. You got to make sure that you don't allow any opportunity for the enemy in your life. Here's a few things. Mark Twain said this about anger. He says, "Anger is an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything in which it is poured." It's interesting, isn't it? Another man said, "I must enjoy anger because I work so hard to keep it alive. A grudge is like a baby." It has to be nursed if it's going to star or if it's going to survive. Anger is inedible. Resentment is optional. Think about that. Resentment is optional. Will Rogers, everybody knows who Will Rogers is. He said, people who fly into a rage often make a bad landing. That's true, isn't it? Then an old Chinese proverb, if you are patient in one moment of anger, you will escape a hundred days of sorrow. Anybody ever tell you, hey, just take a breath. Count to 10. Huh? Sheila told me that yesterday. She said, she said, you need to go over to your office and stay there. <laughs> Good advice from my wife. I mean, have you had a wife that told you that at times? Take a breath. Go away for a moment. I mean, have you got kids? You know what I'm talking about. Take a breath. Another man said, speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech that you'll ever regret. So see, we all need to take those moments. We all, if we're going to walk in love and not allow the enemy access into our life, then there's going to be moments in our life when the best thing that we could do is not say anything. And that's a whole other message. We could, we could spend hours talking about everything the Word says about keeping your mouth shut. There's plenty of scriptures to talk about that. Yeah, maybe. See, we're not, we're not denying things. Man, people say some things that hurt you. Ask me how I know. So yeah, maybe hurtful things were said, hateful, harmful things were spoken, and it stuck around. You ever found yourself rehearsing something that was said? Rehearsing your actions, what you could have done, should have done, wished you had done. If you're not careful, you find yourself rehearsing them. And over and over, they leave you bruised and hurting and brokenhearted. And that's just what the enemy wants. He wants you thinking about it. So you must learn to walk in peace and victory even when others disappoint you. Even when others hurt you. Are you listening to me? Because you see, as long as you can continue to blame everyone else for the attitudes 
that are present on the inside of you, you will never truly be free. Now listen, it's, I say I pride myself. I've, I work with 17 teenage girls every single day in volleyball. 17. Let me say that again. 17 teenage girls. I coach volleyball here. 17 from 6th grade to seniors in high school. You talk about a whirlwind of emotion. And I have found myself on numerous occasions saying, listen dear, I don't care what anybody says about me. You have to move on. And even though you say that, the reality is you do care what people say about you. It's easy to say, well, I don't care what they say. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You might be the richest man on earth, the wisest man on earth, the most powerful man on earth. You care what people say about you. Come on now. We're all penetrable. We're all vulnerable to, to what other people say. What other people think. Yeah, I care about what people think about me. Sure I do. I think sometimes we try to convince ourselves by saying, man, I don't care what people think about me. Well, that's pride, you know. Sure, we care about what people say. But here's the truth. You know, you can always go back to the Word. Psalm 147.3 says that He heals the broken in heart and He binds up their wounds. Literally in one, one translation it says that He tends to our pains like a doctor would an injury or a broken arm. I'll say that again. Literally, when it says He heals the broken in heart and binds up our wounds, literally it says that He tends to our pains like a doctor would an injury or a broken arm. You ever gone to the doctor with an injury? Let me tell you something. I, I dislike, strongly dislike going to the dentist. First time I went to the dentist, I was, was 20, 21, whatever. When Sheila and I got together and she had good insurance because she had a job, particular job in the mall and and uh, so we were able to go to the dentist. And, and I just didn't go growing up. We didn't go to the dentist. And so that was my first time going to the dentist. Man, I strongly dislike the dentist. And it all goes back to that first experience. When I went in there, man, they started doing things. On my, I mean, 20. I hadn't gone in 20 years. And so man, they were chipping and bringing out the chisels and doing all kinds of stuff to, on my teeth and on my gums, and I'd never used floss, and you know, I mean, it was an ugly sight. Huh. And so there was blood everywhere, and I had a headache, and, and they were not easy on me. And so I did not like that at all. Well, because that was the first time when we moved here, we were, we were going to get, she said, I want you to get on a regular schedule, and so we started going to our regular dentist. Well, I have the sweetest lady that you'll ever meet in your entire life, and she is so gentle with sensitive me. But, but if my hygienist is not there, and they've done this to me before, where I go in for my appointment and she's not there, I will walk out the door because I am a sissy, and this woman is gentle, right? How many of you like going to the dentist? You liars. <laughs> liars go to hell. Nobody likes the dentist. That woman told me the other day, she said she has people that fall asleep in the chair while they're getting their teeth cleaned. I'm like, you're out of your mind. That doesn't happen. No. Crazy. There's something wrong with y'all. No, the Bible says that he, Jesus, he heals the wounds of every shattered heart if you trust him. If you place your trust in Him. Yeah, people hurt us. Yes, people injure us. Proverbs 17, 22 says, A merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit, a wounded spirit, dries the bones. What does that mean? It makes you fragile. It makes you fragile. Yeah. A wounded spirit, a broken spirit. See, what are we talking about? A strong spirit is somebody who trusts, who has an open heart. A wounded spirit is somebody who's paranoid and closed off. A strong spirit releases hurts. A wounded spirit accumulates them, counts them up. A strong spirit scars, whereas a wounded spirit has open wounds. I cut my hand, uh, I don't know, three or four weeks ago. I was changing an edger blade on my, on my edger. 
and uh, couldn't get the cotter pin out of it. If you, guys, if you've ever messed with one, you know there, there, there's a bolt that goes on it, but then there's a cotter pin that goes through that bolt to make sure that that blade doesn't slip off there because that would be catastrophic. And so I couldn't get that cotter pin out. So I, I was putting a lot of pressure down on, the, on that. Uh, I grabbed a pair of needle nose pliers and I was trying to push that thing out. Well, without, wasn't using my brain, didn't put any gloves on, but I was putting pressure against that cotter pin and against that blade. Well, my hand slipped and it slipped down the edge of that blade and then the cotter pin went into my hand. Well, and so Sheila was about 15 minutes from being home and so I'm bleeding like a stuck pig, man. I have you know, sliced my hand open here and I'm bleeding and blood's all over my workbench and then I have to walk inside to get it cleaned up so I drop blood and, and so, you know, she thinks I cut my hand off by the time she got in there. Well, and so I've got an open wound. And so she says, I think we need to go to the doctor. And my basic response was a man wouldn't go to the doctor over a little cut. So, so I didn't go. And so, you know, against the advice of my lovely wife, who knows more than I do, for about three weeks I dealt with an open wound on my hand that wouldn't heal up because there was something stuck in the middle of it. So no matter what I did and no matter how much I put bandages on it, this thing remained open and festered because I had something on the inside of it. And all she kept doing was saying, you know, a doctor would have got that out. You know, a doctor would have cleaned that out. You know, a doctor would have sewed that up. You wouldn't be dealing with this no anymore. Well, as gross as this sounds, finally over time I was able to dig out the debris that was in it and it finally healed up but I've got an ugly little scar on there that probably wouldn't be there had I had somebody look at it and do what they're supposed to do. But for three weeks, I dealt with an open wound. Well, an open wound is not comfortable. An open wound is something that's aggravating. It gets in the way, and it, it just causes you all kinds of problems and pain and discomfort. But when it comes to dealing with people, if you allow hurts and resentment and unforgiveness to stay in the way, it's going to be an open wound. It's going to be something that's just there. And so if you're somebody with an open, or a wounded spirit, you're going to have open wounds. You're going to have sores, so to speak, in your relationships that you just can't get over. Getting back to our lives, a strong spirit is thankful, whereas a wounded spirit is resentful and negative. A strong spirit heals others, whereas a wounded spirit hurts others. You know, ultimately, that's what happens. If you don't walk in forgiveness and you allow unforgiveness to take over your life, you lash out at other people and, and you become resentful towards others. Are you with me? A strong spirit heals others and is resilient, whereas a wounded spirit hurts others and is fragile. That's the reality of the situation. And how many of you know it's not okay to stay that way? Again, I don't, I don't want you to, to think that I'm up here saying that we shouldn't experience these things, denying that they happen. No, we all deal with it. I guarantee you I could give you the microphone and we could be here for a week, people talking about their hurts and their resentments and their, their dealings and, and this was done to me. And, and you know, oftentimes people go back to their childhood, things that were done in their childhood and they're still experiencing it in their livelihood right now because they can't get over it. So we're not denying that things happen, but we're saying is you can't stay that way. I said when you can't stay that way. We said that before. You know, the Bible talks about how the Lord said that He would never leave us nor forsake us. The Bible actually says when my mother and father forsake me, the Lord won't. Are you listening to me? Yes, hurts and pains are real, but you got to get over it. Isaiah 53, turn over there familiar passage of scripture again talking about walking in love when you walk in love you keep the door shut on the devil Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5 says surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. One translation says, He endured punishment that made us well. Because of His wounds, we have been healed. See, I feel wounded. I feel hurt. He took it for you. So you no longer have to carry that around. 
Amen? So let me put it this way. So then be quick to repent and quick to forgive. Quick to repent, quick to forgive. That's why the Bible says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Sometimes that involves you being the bigger man or woman and saying, you know what, I'm sorry, I missed it. We've both done that. That's why we've been married for all these years. And, and I'm not telling you our relationship is perfect, but we're still together. Because we have enough sense to realize that there are going to be times when you have to say you're sorry, even though you in your heart of hearts know you didn't do anything intentional. I didn't mean to do what I did. It wasn't in my heart to do, but if I want to make it right, Forgive me. Something happened here. I'm going to take responsibility. That's not easy to do. That's not easy to do with strangers, with co-workers. But you know what? If you want to be successful in this life, if you want to live a long life, if you want to live a long, healthy, fulfilled life, then you'll make that part of your everyday practice. Walking in forgiveness. Walking in forgiveness. Unforgiveness drains the power from your love walk. You may truly be doing everything within your power to walk in love, but if you don't plug the hole of unforgiveness, it's all for nothing. One, one of the things that I, I remember from Brother Hagen that, that has stuck with me over the years is this, this uh, part of his, his book, Love the Way to Victory. Anybody ever read that book? Wonderful book. I think we have it out here in the bookstore. Love the Way to Victory. He says this, In all these years, I've never been sick unless I've missed it somewhere, either in my love walk or in my obedience to God. Every step out of love is sin. Boy, that's a strong statement, isn't it? Every step out of love is sin. Every single time I missed it, I repented just as fast as I could and got back into love and obedience. Normally, the minute I repented, I was healed. I don't mean I had to wait several days for the symptoms to clear up. I was either immediately healed or well on the way to recovery. For more than 60 years in ministry, I have said that if my faith didn't work and my prayers weren't answered, unforgiveness is the first place. Everybody hold up your finger and say, first place. See, maybe you're going through that. Maybe you're, you're at a point where you're, you're believing God for something and you're not getting results. The first place, he said. The first place I would look. I'm not saying that all sickness and disease is caused by unforgiveness. I'm just saying that that's the first place that I would look. So yeah, if you're dealing with symptoms in your body, check your love walk. Why not? <laughs> check your love walk, man. Lord, did I miss it somewhere? Is there an area of my life that I've got unforgiveness? Is there, is there something that you can reveal to me that maybe I missed it? Because if there is, Lord, forgive me. Get right back on track and start walking in health. That's what he's saying here. Again, it doesn't mean that's the case every time, but it's certainly a place to look. Because here's the reality. You can choose to be bitter or you can choose to be better. Right? Did you notice that's, that's one vowel different and it changes everything? Bitter, better. I, E, one vowel different. One vowel different changes everything. The choice is up to you. I like so much, go back to uh, Genesis 37. You know, the love the story of Joseph. You know, this is a, Joseph deals with, with just the easiest way to call it is a series of unfortunate events, right? And we see so much with Joseph here. But this is a series of unfortunate events. We see a story of restoration, forgiveness. I encourage you over the next week or so, because we'll touch on this for a while, but I encourage you to go read this story. Genesis 37, 38, 39, 40, on a, maybe another couple of chapters. Just go read it for yourself, because there's so much here. But it's a story of restoration and forgiveness when life has treated you unfair. You ever been in a situation where you can say, man, that was unfair. Life treated me unfair. What was done to me was unfair. Listen, what was jo done to Joseph was unfair. So here in chapter 37, verse number 3, it says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. Now it's not enough that he loved Joseph more than all his children. How many of you have favorites? If I was to call you up here and said, point out to me your favorite children, Matthew would say he was my favorite. I don't know that Christina would ever say that 
but she probably thinks that. But no parent in their right mind would ever say, you're my favorite kid. We love them all. I said we love them all. But now, obviously the family felt that Joseph was the favorite. And as if that wasn't enough, his daddy made him a coat of many colors to prove that he was the favorite. So here the Bible says that he made his son, he made him, he made him, he made him. Israel made Joseph a coat of many colors. Do you see that? And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him. See, we've been talking about hatred. We've been talking about anger. They hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. So you talk about an ugly carnal conflict, that's right here in the middle of it. So the Bible says that Joseph dreamed a dream and he told his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, they were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheave arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to me. In other words, they bowed to my sheep. And his brethren said unto him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Shall you indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more. Remember the word wrath and contempt? That's what it is. So they hated him all the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father to his brethren, and his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brethren indeed come and bow down ourselves to you? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the same. Do you know people always, think about the wording here, people always hate what they envy the most. Here his brothers, you know, they hated him, but the Bible tells us in verse 11 that they actually envied him. What were they envying? They wanted their father's love. They wanted to be the favorite because they were getting the attention. And so now this dream that says you're going to bow to me, was it true? Well, yeah, we know it was true. Should he have told them? Probably not. So the Bible tells us the brothers envied him, but the father observed the same. Well, you know the story. You know what goes on to happen here. We'll touch on a few things. You know, the Bible tells us that they, they uh, sold him into slavery. They threw him in a pit while they discussed what they were going to do with him because they hated him with contempt and wrath and despised him and were angry with him. Was this fair? I'm looking for a response. This is a Wednesday night Bible study. It's okay. Was this fair? Did he deserve this? Threw him in a pit. Sold him as a slave. You think you've had a bad day. Wait till your brother, your sister, sells you off as a slave. We've all wanted to do it. Yeah, growing up with my brother, if I could have sold him as a slave, you better believe I would have at times. Yeah, he challenged me, man. There was times that, that but you know something? You don't do that to family. You work things out. You talk things out. You walk in, you know there's a scripture in the Bible that says as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. There's some people that won't accept your love if you try to give it. People are going to challenge you. People are going to push you to the limit. But don't ever say life's been unfair to me like it was to him. Because your family has not sold you into slavery. So we know that we're, we're going to skip through this. Here's a life lesson number one. John Mathis, life lesson number one. Life's not fair, but God is faithful. Life's not fair, but God is faithful. Life will smack you right between the eyes sometimes. Things will come up in your life that you can say, man, that, that just wasn't fair. I don't understand. But the reality is, Life's not fair, but God is faithful. 
you know the story, so we're, we're not going to spend a lot of time just going through it line by line, but if anybody had a right to be frustrated and bitter, it was Joseph. If anybody, Joseph dreamed a dream one night, and it led to 23 years of nightmare. He could have spent his entire life worrying about the issues that were beyond his control. He could have been angry. He could have been bitter at the world. I mean, think about this. Look over at Genesis 39, skipping ahead a little bit. Genesis 39, he ends up in Potiphar's house. And so the Bible says in verse 1, we'll skip through here, but in verse 1 it says, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was prosperous. He was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now look down at verse 6. Because he, he, he found grace, the Bible says, in the sight of Potiphar. In verse 6 it says, And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand, and he knew not anything that he had, Save, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. So, so here we find Joseph being promoted. And it came to pass, verse 7, it came to pass that after these things that the master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, behold, my master wants nothing what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is none greater in the house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife, how then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it came to pass as she spoke to Joseph day by day by day by day by day, that he hearkened not to her to lie with her or to be with her. Verse 11, it says, It came to pass at about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men in the house therewith. How many of you know that's problem number one? Huh? Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there with him. He shouldn't have gone into the house. Verse 12 says, She caught him with his garment and said, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment with her in her hand, where he was fled for, that she called unto the men of the house and spake unto them, saying, See, he has brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. And he came unto me to lie with me. And I cried with a loud voice. Is this what happened? It came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried and that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. Verse 20, Joseph's master took him, put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Was this fair? Did he deserve this? Absolutely not. Look over, at, uh, look over at Isaiah 54. No, he didn't deserve this. Could he have avoided it? Yeah. Sure he could have. He could have not been there to begin with. Look at Isaiah 54. We'll see something real quick. Isaiah 54, 17. It says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. You know, we always point out that doesn't mean that it won't be formed. There's going to be times in your life weapons are going to be formed against you, but what the Bible says, no weapon that is formed shall prosper. Now watch this. We quote the first part of that. We all know it. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. What's the second part? And. Every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment you shall condemn, for this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, says the Lord. No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper, and every tongue that rises up against me in judgment shall be condemned. That's the heritage of the Lord. Somebody say, that's my heritage. That's my heritage. Look back at Isaiah 17. 
Why are we saying this? Because people are going to say things. People are going to do things that are going to be hurtful. What do you declare? Isaiah 17, starting with verse number 12. says, Woe to the multitude. Now listen, this one hit me this afternoon as I was studying. Woe unto the multitude of many people which make a noise. There's some loud, obnoxious people out there that are trying to do you harm. Woe to the multitude of people which make a noise like the noise of the sea and the rushing of nations. They make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. The nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke them and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the shape of the mountains before the wind, like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. And behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is not. This is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Oh, somebody say that. No weapon weapon. formed against me shall prosper. prosper. Are you getting this tonight? So if you know that, I said if you know that, then you can walk in love. So you just read a pretty strong scripture. Yeah, I did. But who does it say takes care of you? I said, who does it say takes care of you? The Lord does. So do you, Pastor Mark is doing a series right now. What is it called? Making your battle the Lord's battle. You don't have to do any fighting. All you have to do is declare the Lord's taking care of me. Every tongue that rises up against me shall be condemned. Every hurtful thing that was ever done to me, that's between them and God. I'm going to walk in love. Why should it steal your joy and your peace? Why should you allow it to spring up and trouble you? Do you know that's in fact what the Bible says? It talks about a root of bitterness springing up, troubling you. Everybody stand to your feet. I'm from Texas, man, so anytime I can bring up Texas, I'm going to do it, because that's what we do. I grew up in rattlesnake country. And did you know this, that if you corner a rattlesnake and you give them no way out, did you know they actually start striking at themselves? They do. Because when they feel cornered and feel like there's no way out, they strike, but actually they start striking at themselves. When you feel like there's no way out, you do yourself harm. When you feel like there's nowhere to turn and nowhere to go and you have no place to go, you bring harm to yourself. That root of bitterness springs up and troubles you. That's why it's so important to walk in love. That's why it's so important to be quick to forgive, quick to repent. There's times when you're going to miss it. There's time when they're going to miss it. Just make it right. As much as lies within you, live peacefully with all men. The Lord's called you to walk in love. And as you choose to make, and you make that decision, I'm going to walk in love, then in fact what you're doing is sealing up every crack, every hole, every door, every window where the enemy would have access in your life. If you choose to walk in love, your best days are ahead of you. Days of victory, days of health, days of peace and joy. Don't let anybody bother you. Don't let anybody's words hurt you. You just rise up and just say, I'm a child of the Most High God. Why should I even bother? And just walk in love. Say, ooh, that sounds easy. No, it's not going to be. But you can do it. I said you can do it. Oh, glory to God. Father, we're thankful for your word tonight. Your word is the truth that makes us free as we choose to do it and act on it. Put your word to work in our lives, Father. Our best days are ahead of us. We choose to walk in love, and as a result, we walk in health and victory and prosperity because your word guarantees it. We thank you for it. We thank you you love us just as we are. Mistakes and all. Our heart is to serve you. If we've missed it tonight, reveal it to us. Show us so that we can make it right. 
Help us to walk in love towards others. Move past the hurts and resentment and walk in love like never before. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you. So glad you came tonight. Stay and pray with us if you can. Amen. God bless you.